took a few more rounds than usual to acclimate themselves to the single-level raceway and the demands of high-speed cornering without reference points. From the driver's viewpoint, thundering down a 170-mile-an-hour straightaway, the corners are a bit difficult to unravel. So for many, it was a matter of committing the 10-turn, three-mile course to memory. You have to memorize it more, and you have to picture a curb in your mind rather than looking at it. So you have to remember where you are and then sort of plot your course by memory rather than uh, sight. So I uh, kind of like the course. Uh, it really doesn't have any blind corners. However, it is a little bit difficult in places to find the apex of the corner and knowing uh, exactly where to shut off. I think it, the apex it could be a little bit uh, more well marked, perhaps. But uh, uh, apart from that, I think it's a very nice circuit. Qualifying was slow at first, but as the drivers became accustomed to the track, they set new records faster than a croupier gathers in the dice. Leading the onslaught, Jim Hall's 450 horsepower wing Chaparral. Hall started with the second event in the series. Since then, he's proved his innovations are no mere eye catcher. Both Hall and Hill are in contention for the title and sit 1-2 on the grid today. down under are right behind. New Zealanders Bruce McLaren and Chris Amon and McLaren's tidy red Chevy-powered invention have been consistent contenders throughout the series. Brilliant young Chris Amon qualified just behind the Chaparrales and two spots ahead of McLaren. Well, Lanky Lola, campaigned throughout the series by John Surtees, is the third major chassis style represented. Surtees has put his Chevy-powered beast fourth on the grid. Only five tenths of a second separates Surtees and the next four qualifiers. Scotland's Jackie Stewart, McLaren, former U.S. road racing champ George Fulmer, and USAC great Parnelli Jones. But these four men are the high rollers for this race. Phil Hill. Bruce McLaren, Mark Donahue, and John Surtees are the top four in point standings for the Can-Am Cup with nearly $25,000 at stake for the series winner. Unflappable John Surtees leads going in with 18 points. He started with a stirring victory in the opener at San Jovit, then went pointless till his triumph two weeks ago at the Times Grand Prix. Bill Hill with 18 points has only one overall victory, a thrilling two-heat performance at the Monterey Grand Prix when he and Jim Hall finished their chaparral's 1-2. Young Mark Donahue vaulted into international prominence when he captured first overall at most points, which helped pile up his 17 points. Bruce McLaren has 14 points. No overall victories, but a consistent high place finisher. So based on the point standings, these four men are the odds-on favorites to win the series. But Gurney, Hall, and Eamon do have a mathematical chance. And in the case of the two-car Chaparral and McLaren entries, team strategy might be a factor. Jim, you and Phil, as a team here, have a possibility of finishing 1-2 in this series. Uh, do you, I imagine this uh, has something to do with strategy, how you're going to run this race. Well, Bob, as you know, you can't really start any strategy until after you see what develops in the race. But uh, if we had our choice, certainly uh, we'd try to make it work out that way. Principally, Bruce and I have to finish first and second. Uh, and we're going to try and do it accordingly. Uh, we don't have any definite strategy, but we're going to see how the race progresses. Jackie, here we are at the climatic event of the Can-Am Series. Uh, what is your strategy on running this race today? Well, I obviously to try and win it, but uh, I don't think at this point we have any strategy. Uh, I personally, I think we'll be taking things a little bit easy because it's an extremely hard circuit on brakes. And I feel that uh, quite a few of the cars are going to drop out by this. I'm just going to run it as I see it. Uh, we're going to have to come from behind if we're going to do anything. So I'll push as hard as I can and we'll see what happens. And hope your car's in good shape and they'll stand the gap. Is that it? Right. It looks a little bit dodgy on uh, brakes. I notice everybody's a little bit shy of brakes, and 
I feel like uh, I wouldn't mind if we had a little more horsepower, but uh, I think we've got it working fairly well now. Well, Bob, uh, the way I feel about it, I just drive as hard as I can all the way. And uh, to at least if, uh, unless I get out, I'm fortunate enough to get up in front where uh, I could have somewhat of a lead, uh, I might back off there. But other than that, I drive hard all the way. Jim Hall broke all records in his Chaparral 2E with a 114 mile per hour lap. Teammate Phil Hill, second in the Can-Am standings, is behind Hall, a second floor. Then New Zealander Chris Amon to complete the front row. Canadian American Challenge Cup leader John Surtees starts the second row with Jackie Stewart next. Fourth in the series standing, Bruce McLaren opens the third row, followed by George Palmer and Parnelli Jones. Young Mark Donahue, third in the standing, is 14th on the grid. The Stardust Grand Prix will really be a Las Vegas extravaganza. Thirty-three speedsters poised on the Stardust grid. And there's the checker. Surtees, McLaren, and Stewart take advantage of the long straight and make a bold play for the lead. They're four abreast heading for turn one. And it's Surtees squeezing by Hall at the corner to grab the lead from a third row starting position. Hall is second coming out of that first turn jam up. Yes, now England's John Surtees is the point man, following the magnificent maneuver at the start. Jim Hall in pursuit of the rest of the pack, dropping in a single file through these tricky turns. the car's hurt any uh it, it's probably down on performance a little bit because uh he's got some extra drag but uh 
I don't think the car is hurt any. He'd probably be all right if he can uh, just keep in there. The Chaparral out of his mirror for the moment. Surtees devotes himself to the perplexities of the course as he leads Stewart and Jones to the sickening switchback of the S's. driving well within himself now. Jackie Stewart next. A few steps back of the front three come Bruce McLaren and Dan Gurney, who's been moving up. battle for seventh. It's the most exciting action in the race. Right behind them, Aston Gregory barely leads dashing Peter Repson in another two-man battle royal. Third place McLaren has told his deficit to 13 and slim margin over Gurney. It's Jackie Stewart who's McLaren's next target. But Stewart's off the track. We Scott plows up the moonscape, sending clouds of desert into the air and giving a photographer and course worker some anxious moments. Three fires quickly quenched. Then Stewart disappears in the science fiction movie myth. That excursion didn't cause some damage. Cornelia Jones assumes second after Stewart blasts through the sand pile. McLaren's right on top of Jones. Chris Amon brings the other Team McLaren car into the pit. A pit stop during these short races can only mean trouble, and it looks bad. demise. Chris Economaki in the pits to learn what happened from Eamon. I had the same trouble in practice yesterday. It's not actually a gearbox itself. It's a limited slip diff. And uh, we broke one yesterday. And put it, it was an old one. We put a new one in. And it's gone too. Why? I really don't know. McLaren, meantime, is pressing on. He's passed Parnelli Jones and taken second. Jackie Stewart has been out of contention since his earlier trip to the Rocky Bird. This time, it looks like the likable Scott's out for good. Stewart's problem is diagnosed as a ruptured gas line, and he retires the Lola permanently, abandoning it to the desert waste. Remarkable John Surtees, with things very much his own way, is following in command and setting his own pace. McLaren is now second. Followed by Gurney, Jones, and Phil Hill. Parnelli heading toward turn two. But Jones resists the crippled Chaparral and holds on to fourth. Fulmer and 
Donahue are still at it. Palmer in the number 16 Lola best Donahue and grabs six. 20 laps after having been passed by Donahue. Dan Gurney puts it in the paddock, a broken drive shaft responsible. Jones and Hill continue their duel. And then Phil Hill's wing snaps in almost the same place as partner Jim Hall. Hill severely slowed, and Parnelli Jones now sits uncontested and solidly in third. Hill brings the wounded Chaparral to the pit. This time it's decided surgery is warranted, especially since Hill is so high in the series point standing. The damaged body work is cleaned up. At the same time, the faulty wing is removed and a brace inserted to buttress the upright support. Hill will be able to return to the fray. Chris Economaki talks with Hall's partner, Hap Sharp. A very tough fray, Cap. I guess he's blown the series lead, hasn't he? I would say he definitely has, Chris. What was the problem there? Identically the same problem that you a fatigue failure. Uh, Jim said at the time that he came in that the same thing would probably happen to Phil's car because they've, they've both got about the same time on them. Parnelli Jones joins the ranks of the sideline. Gearbox trouble taking him the last few laps. He'll be in and out, but finish the race. Palmer and Donahue dogfight continues and with retirements up front, battling now for third behind Bruce McLaren. Down the pit straight, Donahue moves on Palmer as his boss, Roger Penske, signals, go get him. Donahue shoves his foot to the board and nips by Palmer just at the end of the pit straight. Consistent Mark Donahue finds himself in third place as the race enters its final lap. Surtees through all of this has been quietly averaging more than 110 miles per hour. Claris on the same lap in second. Palmer pits and retires after a furious race-long battle with Mark Donahue. And everyone else might as well be chasing the long afternoon shadows as Surtees is a runaway. Lucky Bruce McLaren is on the same lap but unable to close. And Mark Donahue holds third with the prospect of enough points to finish second in the series. Bill Hill is still circulating. Jones, too, but with only fourth gear available. And there's the checker for John Surtees. Peter Remsen finished fourth after a steady ride, and Hill Chaparral finishes out of the points in seventh. Stardust Grand Prix and Can-Am title to John Surtees, who averaged almost 110 miles an hour for the race and led it from wire to wire. He wins some $40,000 for less than two hours at the wheel. Well, the race went very well. In fact, it developed a little better than I had hoped it would. Uh, early on, naturally, it was very close, but most of the time, uh, I was able to sort of keep the car well in hand and sort of basically drive as I wanted to, which was the main thing. John, many uh, competitors in today's race went out with mechanical troubles, suspension problems primarily, and transmission problems. You had none of those troubles, did you? Um, I don't think so. I had this vibration, but uh, the course is very hard on a car. You have to use the gearbox a lot because you've got a wide variation of corners. You've also got a very rough section uh, on the straight which tends to uh, give the car a fairly hard time. And so uh, this was to be expected, I think. We tried, in practice, to do as few laps as possible uh, so uh, that we didn't wear the car out too much. Mark Donahue, following his third place finish, barely edged Bruce McLaren for second in the series. What about the trials and tribulations of running in this tough series? What's the big problem? Oh, the biggest problem is making sure that you finish the car, but still at the same time uh, running it just as bad as hard as you possibly can to stay uh, in contention during the race. Congratulations, Bruce. Third place in the first Canadian American Challenge Cup Series and second overall in the Stardust Grand Prix. A fine performance for you and your car. Are you pleased? Well, finishing second at this stage is almost like not finishing at all, Chris. We're not too happy, but that was as good as we could do. The car ran, the car ran perfectly. 
I drive it as hard as I could with it. Could go and we finish second. Yeah, that's it. What about the race itself? Did it develop the way you thought it would? Um, no, not really. I expected more di uh, more close racing for first place. Uh, 30 got into that lead very early and uh, took advantage. I think of a little bit of bunching up that we had uh, in the first couple of laps. And he really made a beautiful break. He was he was going particularly was going very fast. Um, I expected a few more cars to finish, particularly the Chaparrales. That's unusual for them. And uh, as far as I was concerned, it's about the most hectic race uh, I've, ha I've ever had. The Can-Am series was judged an immediate success. In its first year, more than 150,000 people saw the six events and more than $250,000 was awarded. Nor was there a more fitting setting for the finale than the Stardust Grand Prix.